Oh, uh, hello there, everybody. What's up? It's Wes, Hank, and Andy. We are about what? A, what is going on here? That's the wrong layout. What's that? There we go. That's better. It is we. God, it is. It's us. It is uh, all the beard you've come to know and love. Yep. <laughs> here we are, uh, episode uh, three fifteen. Three fifteen. Oh my. Well, oh, sorry, did I? Did I get ahead of myself? Well, there's only 15 in the season. Oh, there's only 15 in the season. Top. You're right. Well, the two and the five. Season finale. <laughs> my gosh. Next week, I'll be wearing my glasses. <laughs> I've got everything in dark mode tonight. Everything that I could make dark is dark. So things look a little bit different. And so I'm just kind of getting used to it. So please bear with me. No worries. How's everybody doing this week? How did we, uh, how did we manage this week with uh, the episode? Not bad. No, not bad. I, I did not expect them to go there. No, I, I expected the chase because we saw that in the trailer, but I didn't know where they were going to do it and why they were doing it. Ah, uh, right. So that was kind of neat. Right, right. I did not I'm, expect. Uh, I'm almost more like it was good. I had a really good time. Um, the vehicle combat was amazing. Like the just the, the sheer like the the way they shot it and the way it. Um, was animated was great but i'm almost a... more excited for the little trailer that they dropped this the you know the the last four the uh, if we all go in we're not all making <laughs> yeah. it out yeah so that. that 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 did more than maybe the last eight episodes for me <laughs> it like, was remarkable how much of that trailer by the way was uh footage from the last episode yep, from yep. the uh attack on pabu mm -hmm. can't spoil everything with only three episodes left I have some questions. Well, before I get to those questions, and because we can continue talking about our thoughts here, but we should probably get to our next installment of Bad Star Wars Jokes. It just wouldn't be a show if we didn't have one. I, I said this in our, uh, in our private chat this week, that the, the jokes, the curated ones that I've, we've been combing the internet for, I feel like we have gone through the the, Majority the lion's share of good ones, and we are now <laughs> at the point where if like if we cannot gently massage, reword, rewrite the jokes to make them funny, we're almost at the point now where we are literally writing our own. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I have it on one occasion at least taken another joke and just dipped it in Star Wars. To, you know. <laughs> Three Jawas in a trench coat. But um, boom. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I did that this week. I did find a Star Wars joke, and it wasn't a great. The punchline was good. the The buildup was not. So I've I've combined a couple things. I've kind of made it my own. Put a little Star Wars twist on it, and I'd like to share that with you now. Let her fly, guys. Did you hear about the angry power droid? No. Well, you'd be angry too if people kept pushing your buttons. <laughs> nice. I don't know. Was that was that actually good? No, that was all it's right. Appropriate. I mean, we got gonky. <laughs> that was all right. I thought it was okay. I mean, that's that's the level that we're talking about now. <laughs> I'm curious what the original delivery was. I'd have to go and find it. Okay, well, it was, it in the chat, not, throw it to me in the it chat. It was not that good. <laughs> so, um. We have to get this out of the way. There are only three episodes left. Yes. Last week I had said how much I, in a roundabout way we talked about, uh, well, filler episodes. And I don't want to say that this was straight up filler because like you, Hank, I enjoyed the crap out of this one, yeah. especially the vehicle stuff, which I've lovingly put together tonight. Certainly the book and save it from being that. Yeah. You know, and the yeah, fact they that do, who, yeah. who they rescue is kind of steeped in the plot of the whole show. That one, that, that but it did still crap, kind of feel like, excuse me, you know, <laughs> it was I'd, one of the shorter I, ones though. I think right? I said to Doug oh, yeah. the other day we were hanging out and I'd said like, I really hope we don't get to the last two episodes and I'm completely blown away. And I'm like, man, they could have done the entire season in four three. episodes <laughs> right exactly <laughs> oh wouldn't that just be so disappointing right? right like why did we have a whole season when all we needed was this right but at the same time is that where you go when you know this is your final season because i've always and you guys know this i've always been about if you're going to tell me a star wars story that's not written by george lucas 
Yep. It's got to matter. It's got to mean something. I yeah, don't... I mean, is this a case of that that meaning that the point that matters and the meaning won't be found until later on when we see how it connects to other projects? That's like entirely possible. Like a, the Mando Grogu movie. Well, that's kind of where I'm at. I feel like everything right now is pushing towards that that the stuff that we've seen over the last uh, two to three years since we've been reviewing so Star Wars the, media. And I was enjoying the culminate. yeah. Like in terms of Mando, I'm enjoying the story of the first two seasons. We get, sure. get, we get you hooked on the cute little puppet. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. Really, that felt more wor world buildy than a lot of this. A lot of this is like we're looking for those world building. Let, let me see the transition from uh re uh republic to empire and we don't we, we've been like where is that we want to see some more of that it probably happens much later we're still it's early interesting that you say world it's building not because as world building as say that, mando i have to be honest though where where it comes to this week's episode uh juggernaut i actually that is the part of the episode that i appreciated the most okay I do have a slide dedicated to the world building aspect, which we're going to, we're going to look at. And it could just be that star Wars poetry, those rhyming stanzas coming through again. But I really felt that this was so cohesively star Wars that it felt like star Wars, at yeah. least recent star Wars. Yes. That I really enjoyed that aspect of it. Yeah. It, it was back to that. See, this is a thing we also haven't mentioned yet. And they haven't been doing it this season, which is that animated style pacing. Mm. that like breakneck quick cuts back and well, forth amongst yeah, that's true they haven't done a lot of that this season and this no, episode no. was very much that animated like yep. that clone wars pacing right yeah i mean when the action is high it things tend to to move faster and yeah. it really is the case in this episode and they're good at it so it's like yeah stick to what you you know like they're real good at it last week we were chewing on uh, the title as we have uh, in past weeks by looking ahead and we looked at the title for this week. Oh, it's juggernaut. <laughs> we, we had some questions about, we were predicting what does juggernaut mean? And I think I had said, well, it isn't that a, the clone turbo tank is also mm -hmm. called a juggernaut. So on the nose. Nailed that, it. <laughs> nailed it. Does it <laughs> nailed it. Does that count as a Kaiju? <laughs> <laughs> well i mean if you if you understand that uh it did eventually become the ad at walker i suppose in the roundabout way yeah, yeah. it's a mecca it's mecca uh thing <laughs> there, there's kim <laughs> nailed it by the way that ladies and gentlemen that is the voice of our nailed it that's her everybody that's my my lovely wife <laughs> all right um, are you guys ready to get into it? Yeah, let's go for it. All right. Bear with me as I get things set up here. Um, we are trying one of the new features on our, uh, host platform on StreamYard that, which now supports, uh, video backgrounds. So if anybody I, gets oh, space sick, yeah, just let us know. Yeah, really. Comment. I will, if it is really, really <laughs> hard to look at, I will switch it. But as we switch into our uh, presentation view, let me offer a look at our new ooh, dynamic spacey background. Here we go. Um, <laughs> slowly switch the lights to green to see it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. This one is called Juggernaut. It is uh, Star Wars: The Bad Batch, Episode uh, Twelve of uh, Season Three. The original air date was Wednesday, April tenth, two thousand twenty-four. This one, written by Ezra Nachman and directed by Stuart Lee. Our runtime is an advertised twenty-three minutes, or an actual nineteen minutes and thirty-four seconds without titles or credits. Andy. In fact, it does dethrone last episode, uh, last week's so episode, taking the crowd. becoming the new shortest episode of the mm -hmm. season. Might be Our, the shortest one of, of ever of the, of the run, maybe yeah. of ever. I'd have to go back and look at the uh, nineteen at minutes feels, yeah, 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 uh, nineteen thirty four, yeah, a full minute uh, shorter than last week. Our episode synopsis this week reads: While seeking an unexpected source. The Batch must make a daring escape. All right, let's get into it. Oh my gosh, what am I doing here? I there know. we go. All right, the uh, episode opens with the CX Dagger descending on Mount Tentis. It's nighttime at the secret facility, and a steady rain is falling. The ship wheels around to face backwards before settling on the pad, and Dr. Hemlock is there to meet them. The gangway drops open, and CX-2 pushes Omega down the steps. 
Now, face to face with Hemlock, CX2 removes the binders from Omega's wrists and takes up a position behind her. In his sinister voice, Hemlock tells Omega, Turning yourself over was a wise decision. Come with me. The doctor turns to walk back inside the fortress, so CX2 encourages Omega to follow with another push on her shoulder. And without so much as a word, CX2 returns to his ship not to be seen again in this episode. I don't think we're done with him, though. Oh, we are absolutely not done with him. We gotta have the big reveal. And I really hope they don't save that to the, like, the last, last, last no. episode. Because if it is tech, we gotta have a resolution to that in the last episode. <laughs> yeah. All right, Hemlock leads Omega through the facility past squads of stormtroopers and other Imperials going about their duties. Arriving at the medical lab, one of the commandos on guard opens the door for them, and both Hemlock and Omega enter the antechamber where the body scanner passes over them. Uh, once inside the lab, they are met by Dr. Emery Carr, wringing his hands again. Hemlock tells her to begin testing Omega. He wants confirmation immediately that her sample is as he suspects. Omega and Emery meet each other's gaze, which isn't lost on Hemlock as he asks, is there a problem? Emery tells him no, and that she'll handle it. Uh, by the way, is that the, when it loops back around, is that anybody finding that annoying? The, the flicker? No, not that I noticed. No, okay. So it's just me. It. It's just me catching it in my periphery. Okay. We will we'll forge on. All right. So Omega looks around the lab and asks where Nalase is. And uh, Hemlock tells her that she's in a cell where she won't be able to help with another escape attempt. Hemlock says that he'll return later for the results and then exits the lab. Now alone together, Omega uh, goes to Emery and tells her, you don't have to do this. Emery sighs as she prepares a blood draw before telling Omega she's sorry, but she does. Omega hops up onto the bench next to her and holds out her hand. Pressing the device to the back of Omega's hand, Emery says, for what it's worth, I'm glad you're safe. Omega looks up at her. Am I? But Emery just averts her gaze. Can't even look at her. No. Can't even face it. But this is, this is, you know, going back to that conflict that Emery was experiencing before. She's still struggling, I think. Yep. Got that guilt. On Pabu, Hunter and Batcher slink through the market. Taking out his macro binoculars, Hunter watches as the LAAT gunships return to the Star Destroyer that's still hovering over the town. He taps the comm button on his helmet, but he gets nothing but static. But with no Imperial presence on the ground, the two are able to make their way to the Archeum without incident. Inside the building, Crosshair and Wrecker, who seemingly has recovered from his injuries, are waiting for them. I thought perhaps that this was going to be far worse for Wrecker. Uh, yeah, I, I, I was completely wrong. I, I, like, it's very out of character for the Empire to completely pull out. Mm -hmm. so we don't know if they've actually pulled out the now granted the the venator is no longer directly over top of the archeum it's now yeah. kind of pulled off the i island. guess i'm sort of basing that on what crosshair says maybe maybe hunter tells him that the troopers have pulled out but the star destroyer is still jamming their comms wrecker climbing to his feet and rubbing the back of his head which is no doubt still sore from the explosion <laughs> lets loose on crosshair I still can't believe you let Omega turn herself in. With a definite sting in his voice, Crosshair relates how the Empire would have destroyed the entire town, but it was Omega's surrender that stopped them. Hmm. Still frustrated at the whole situation, Wrecker continues, Yeah, and they've got her. Again. And we're stuck here without a ship. Hunter tells them that even if they had a ship, there's still no way that they'd find Tantis. Crosshair's right hand begins to tremble, and he grabs it as he sh uh, sheepishly says, It's not exactly true. Thinking Crosshair has lied to them, Wrecker goes off, Wait, you've known where Tantas is this whole time? But Crosshair corrects him, I didn't say I know. Continuing, he tells them there is someone who might know the coordinates. And with his hands on his hips, Hunter leans forward, Who? Crosshair tells them, Admiral Rampart. He sent Nalase to the facility when the Empire decommissioned uh, Tipoka City. Dumbfounded, Hunter closes the gap between himself and Crosshair. Why didn't you say anything before? With some trepidation, Crosshair's eyes dart around as he tells them that Tantis is a place that he never wanted to go back to. Adding that Admiral Rampart isn't exactly trustworthy, 
Crosshair calls him a last resort, but adds that he is their only option. Hunter asks where he is now. Crosshair is about to tell them uh, where he was sent after he was arrested, but is interrupted by Batcher, who starts to growl and bark. Suddenly, the central column inside the Archeum begins to slide down into the floor, revealing a secret tunnel below. The Batch all draw blasters and prepare for whatever's coming next. But then a lift slides into place, carrying Fijanoa and AZ-3, who waves his hands frantically. Do not shoot! B steps forward. I second that. AZ says that he found her when he was scouting, and Fee tells them that she saw the Imperials on her approach, and that after she landed, AZ filled her in on the situation. Hunter just, asks she, her. She says she lands in the in the cave system too, right? She's in, everybody uh, yeah, just I mean, lands. That's the place to go if you want to be undetected, I guess. <laughs> just land in the caves. Exactly. And as much exploring as Omega did, she didn't find an elevator. <laughs> the cave that they played in so many times the cave before. Elevator. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Where's the bat phone? Yeah, really. Hunter asks her how she got in there unseen, and Fee tells him that she used the hidden cave entrance after she docked her ship. <laughs> Crosshair blurts out, we're going to need to borrow that. Facing the sniper, she says, you must be Crosshair. Tech told me all about your sparkling personality. Crossing his arms uh, across his chest, he asks, is that a no? But Fee smirks at him as she says, any friend of brown eyes is a friend of mine. Where are we heading? I had uh, said that she seemed rather indignant or rather cold to her affectations where tech was concerned. And now we've got a, a little bit more of the softer side. Yes. Yeah, she's holding on to hope. You think so? Yeah. That's not a, he's gone forever. That's oh, well, he's just gone right now. Okay. Maybe. I hope so, but we shall see. We shall see. All eyes look to crosshair and he tells them uh, an Imperial labor camp on the planet Erebus. He smiles as she looks to Hunter. Ooh, I like this already. So, uh, Erebus, that is a new planet uh, making its first appearance here. We've never been here before, but um, it is worth uh, pointing out that in Greek mythology, Erebus is the primordial god of darkness and shadows. The name is sometimes used as a synonym for the realm of Tartarus or Hades. So quite literally, this imperial prison world is hell. <laughs> I thought that was cool. <laughs> Cut to the surface of the planet where a massive sloped wall like structure dominates the void uh, of a deep valley. At the base of the structure, an enormous door slides open, and an HAVW A6 juggernaut, commonly referred to as a turbo tank, rolls out onto a dirt road. The juggernaut rolls past a series of barriers at the base of a tall observation tower and onto a long bridge that spans an even deeper chasm within the valley. Somewhere over the bridge, the juggernaut rolls up on a gargantuan mobile mining platform that rests on treads that are two-thirds the size of the entire tank itself. This thing is massive. The juggernaut backs up and with the sound of air brakes, uh, comes to a halt just a few meters from the platform. This is what I wanted to uh, talk about when I was alluding to earlier um, about the design language and how it just feels cohesive. I just like, does the empire have a thing for sloped walls? Mm -hmm. Yeah. We've got this, uh, this essentially it looks like the dam from Aldani and Andor. Um, but it also reminds me of the facility on Morak. And if you want to take it a step further, I mean, even Vader's castle on uh, Mustafar, they all have this like angular, yeah, uh, exterior, which that ties it all up for me. I like that. It's pretty mm. obvious now where the handrail money went. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we gotta we gotta get our angles right. All right. So while we're talking about uh, design stuff, we should probably talk about uh, the juggernaut itself, seeing it is it is the uh, focal point of uh, this uh, this week's episode. Uh, the uh, sorry, where am I at here? The H A V W A six juggernaut. As I said, it is commonly referred to as a turbo tank. Now, this was first conceptualized by Joe Johnston for The Empire Strikes Back, and that design, although it did not make the movie, morphed into what would become the uh, the all-terrain armored transport, the AT-AT, hmm. or AT-AT, depending on how you prefer to pronounce it. Now, uh, the design would make its first appearance as the Juggernaut uh, in 1989 in the Imperial Sourcebook for the Star Wars role-playing game published by West End Games. We've talked about this before, but it's nice to revisit that. Mm-hmm. 
Now, it wouldn't be seen again until 2005, where it made its live-action debut in Revenge of the Sith. And then it pops up again in 2016's Rogue One. And we get a variant version, this one, the HCWV A9.2 Juggernaut in The Mandalorian mm -hmm. in uh, 2020. Although, unlike the A6, this version is unarmed, has no weapons. Mm. So there you go. There's the uh, lineage of the Juggernaut. I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's the Juggernaut. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> Inside the mining platform, a helmeted worker struggles to couple a section of large hose uh, with another one. He pries on his huge wrench with both hands, but the coupling fails, sending the worker to the floor on his back, while a gout of steam uh, puffs out from the hose and a klaxon sounds. A short alien worker standing on a ladder barks at the fallen man incomprehensibly before he ambles down the ladder and he hits the shutoff lever. But then he's right back, standing over the man, waving his arms and still yelling. The fallen worker pulls off his helmet, and it's a disheveled Edmund Rampart. His hair now a shaggy mop, and he's sporting a full beard. With piercing eyes, he hisses at the alien. Don't you order me around. You're the one slowing us down. Um, my, my, how the mighty have fallen <laughs> since the last time we saw him. Um, he's got a broken a, nose. Look. So... I'm not the only one who thought Bro, that. he's got a broken. This, I just noticed it now. Is it a? I wondered, is this a lighting thing or is it in fact? <laughs> a, that's a busted nose, man. Come on. Okay. Chances are you got into a fight in prison. Like, don't you know well, who I am? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, strangely right. enough, that hasn't. He's still kind of. Yeah, he's still like I'm above you. Yeah, yeah. If anything, he's got more fire in his eyes. No, that yeah. could be the. Well, there's definitely more color in in uh, it, now. Mind you, I'd be fired up too if I was, you know, peeved at one of my coworkers. Hmm. All right, we'll cut to the Providence barreling through hyperspace. On board, Fee and the Bad Batch gather around a hollow table in the crew compartment. Fee says that she had to call in a favor with one of her contacts. Then flipping a switch on the table, she says that she has an overview of the labor camp at uh, Erebus. A 3D scale image of the topography around the labor camp flickers to life and everyone studies it intently. Hunter asks if Fee can get him uh, get them close to the perimeter without being detected. Confidently, Fee retorts, I know I can. Tricks of the trade. But then she warns them that once they're past the perimeter, they'll have guards, sensors, and scouts to contend with. Wrecker balks at her, huh, give us a real challenge. Then Hunter interjects that once they hit the ground, they have to tap into the prison data bank and find Rampart's location. Crosshair points to a spot on the hollow map and says that they can use a terminal at one of the checkpoints. Hunter leans in and pushes a button on the hollow table and the image zooms in to a guard tower at the end of a bridge. Resolved to their impending course of action, Hunter tells Fee that once they have the target, they'll radio her for a pickup. Then the camera pushes in on Hunter's unblinking eyes as he stares at the map. Well, the Providence drops out of hyperspace over Erebus, and Fee begins her approach. The Batch are gathered in the cockpit with her when several blips flash across the forward display. Wrecker points out that if they get any closer to those ships, they'll be detected. Uh, but with a coy smile, she says, no, we won't. Then she begins shutting down several of the ship's systems as she asks, remember that trick I mentioned? <laughs> Hunter is visibly nervous, but Fee tells him, oh, relax. Adding, I'd expect you to know a stealth approach when you see one. B slaps the forward con uh, console and the ship's thrusters cut out completely. Wrecker and Crosshair are jostled from the sudden inertial change. B jams both of her feet under the pedals and she lifts them as far as they'll go. And the ship plummets like a stone through the planet's atmosphere right past a pair of class four container transports and their attack shuttle escorts. Love this part. Clearing the cloud cover, they see the ground racing up towards them. So Fee restarts the engines, slams down the pedals, and hauls back on the control yoke, pulling the Providence out of its death dive. Then the ship pulls into a hover just a few feet off the ground, and the boarding ramp drops open, and the Bad Batch all leap out before Fee and the Providence, sticking low to the ground, pull away to await their signal. That was a super exciting yeah. segment. I liked it very much. Mm. All right. 
Having made their way to the bridge that spans the valley, Hunter leads the group past several barricades as they avoid a patrolling stormtrooper. Now, the trooper, thinking he saw something, stops to look in their direction. But the batch is tucked in tight against one of the barriers out of sight. So the trooper continues his patrol route. Once he's out of sight, the batch move up to the next barrier. The trooper rounds a corner of the guard tower and approaches a second trooper stationed there. The first trooper says, quiet as usual, while his obviously bored counterpart pipes up, hopefully next assignment we'll see some action. But the old adage, be careful what you wish for, couldn't be more apt as a pair of stun blasts ring out, dropping both of them before they can react. That was the first time this season I've laughed out loud. I love that. <laughs> um, also love that uh, Steve Bloom was our uh, trooper number two. Nice. Steve hmm. Bloom, uh, Zeb, uh, Zeb Aurelius. Oh, nice. Who, I'm a huge fan of. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so Crosshair and Hunter lower their weapons and they rush to the panel just above where the troopers are now taking a nap. Hunter orders Crosshair to plug in and find out where Rampart is being held. So he removes the cover and he takes out a data pad and gets to work. Inside the mining platform, Rampart finishes coupling another steam line while his diminutive co-worker sits atop the coupling still ranting at him in an alien language. Sitting down on, ne on a nearby crate, Rampart pulls off his helmet and he wipes the sweat from his brow with the sleeve of his orange coveralls. Why haven't we heard the signal? Our shift was supposed to be over by now. Rampart's co-worker, who's now climbed down from the coupling, lifts off his helmet and turns out it's an Ugnaught. The Ugnaught, who's still quite animated, waves his hand at Rampart as he continues to babble away. Frustrated, Rampart says, I've told you I don't speak whatever it is you speak. In the distance, a whistle blows, signaling the end of the shift, and the Ugnaught concludes himself and walks away. Sighing, Rampart remarks, at least we're in agreement on that. Then we cut to the outside of the mining platform, where one by one, each worker is cuffed in binders before boarding the turbo tank. All right, we should probably uh, take a second here, and, and seeing as he's featured so prominently, talk about Ugnaughts. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Uh, Ugnaughts, they are porcine humanoids that first appeared in the Empire Strikes Back uh, in the Cloud City sequence. In fact, in uh, Marvel Comics, uh, Star Wars number 56 from 1981, Ugnaughts were said to be native to Bespin. Hmm. That was later retconned uh, to the planet Gentes. G-E-N-T-E-S. Gentes. That is still, uh, that is until most of the population was sold into slavery. Now, Gentes is the third planet of the Anuat system. That planet made its first appearance in the 1989 uh, role-playing game supplement Star Wars Galaxy Guide 2, Yavin and Bespin. Now, Ugnaughts are considered to be one of the hardest working species in the galaxy, and they have a great oral tradition, as we saw in The Mandalorian, with Quill. Mm -hmm. There you go. There's a little history on the, uh, the Ugnaughts. On the Ugnaughts. Ugnaughts. Now, I... I wasn't going to make a big deal out of this, but like, by the time, like I said, by the time you've got to our show, everybody else has talked about this and we're kind of like last to the table. So I can't help, but be influenced sometimes by some of the, the other conversations that are being had. I heard this earlier in the week that people, some people, I would think it's a, 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 a not a, a majority think that the orange prison coveralls may have been an early inspiration for the rebel alliance flight suit mm -hmm. i just i mean i wasn't going to do anything but then i'm like you know what there's enough there i might as well like let's take a look at at uh, these orange coveralls and and put some context on them um i have to be honest i just equate them to like regular inmate coveralls like things that we would see here in like north america mm. yeah which there is a precedent for that because as far back as uh, 2005 in uh, the Dark Horse comic series, Star Wars Empire, Wrong Side of the War, we can see Imperial prisoners uh, shown to be wearing orange coveralls that actually have the Orabesh symbol for the letter P written on them, P mm -hmm. for prisoner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we have the Narkina 5 uh, uh, coveralls that are, although they're not orange, they do have orange accents. And Andy, I'd said to you, like, do you think that maybe this, that these are like, like a working man's clothing. And I immediately thought of the shipbreakers from like barracks. Yeah. To me, to me, they've always been like high biz almost yeah. like construction gear. That's what I thought too, especially yeah. with the, uh, the yellow accents, but then, you know, like Brasso and I, I use Brasso as my example, but 
it's not a great one because Brasso's orange garment is actually a jacket. It's a jacket and he's got bib, uh, bib style overalls over top. Yeah, but so, he's still got the yellow, I'm assuming reflective accents on it, on the sleeves. Oh yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. The but color like of the, the mining whole... guild uniforms, Kestis. Oh, that's got, there's orange in them. I too, did. Right? I went so I went and looked at the shipbreakers on on Braca, and right his his buddy, um, his alien friend, has got a, like a it's like an armored chess piece, but it's not really it's not really orange. Hmm. No, this is the wrong figure. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> he's other... we don't see him wearing um, no. wearing anything other than that. The whole flight suit thing. I mean, the first thought was, well, considering that uh, Rebel Alliance flight suits come in like what, uh, one, two, three, four, five colors, um, orange just being one of there them. There it is, bud. There it is. Oh, there it's we cool. go. Also it's orange. Cool. Yep. So there. I mean, there is a precedent here. I personally just think that these are just straight up prison cup rolls. Yeah. Yeah, I and you know, that. at the end of the day, in a galaxy that big, there's like what. You know, 128 colors. <laughs> <laughs> at, at least. <laughs> and you want to identify your prisoners same way you want to identify down pilots. So high biz so, mix. Yeah, high sense. biz. Yeah. Yeah. I even looked at the Mandalorian to go and look at um, Mayfeld. His is actually yellow. Hmm. It's a, like a mustardy yellow. Hmm. Um, so even the New Republic stuck to that sort of idea of like make them visible. Yeah. Well, on board the uh, Juggernaut, a uh, Rampart is escorted along with the other prisoners by a stormtrooper to their seats. In the cockpit, the driver radios the prison to tell them that they're returning to base now. Meanwhile, the Bad Batch has moved into position on the side of the road in one of the deep ditches. Hunter pops up and he looks down at the road with his macro binoculars <clears throat> where he can see the Juggernaut approaching. He then, Did I skip something? I don't think so. I did. Yeah, there's a, I absolutely did. I missed an entire. Yeah, we're on they, the right slide. It's the wrong narrative. I apologize for that. They have a please, conversation about how to get here. Please allow me to back up. <laughs> At the guard tower, Crosshair has jacked into the Imperial data bank, and a real-time uh, tracking blip on the display shows that Rampart is on the move from the mining platform back to the prison. Hunter says that the prison is on the opposite side of the bridge, and the best chance to bag him is to intercept the transport en route. Wrecker is enthusiastic at the thought of taking on a turbo tank. Crosshair reminds Hunter they can't take it head on because they'll see them coming. Now racing to the other side of the tower, Hunter steps up on the railing and uses his macro binoculars to zoom in on a section of the road that connects the prison uh, to the mine. This particular section of the road has deep ditches on either side of it, and Hunter tells them, not if we're under it. Leaping off the railing at a run, he beckons the others to follow him. There we go. That's the right narrative. Sorry about that. On board the Juggernaut, Rampart is escorted along with the other prisoners by a stormtrooper guard to his seat. In the cockpit, the driver radios the prison to say that they're returning to base now. Meanwhile, the Bad Batch has moved into position on the side of the road in one of the deep ditches. Hunter pops up and looks down the road with his macro binoculars where he can see the Juggernaut approaching. Then uh, He then orders the others to get into position. He says he'll secure the controls while Wrecker and Crosshair look after Rampart. With grapple guns drawn, they move quickly to the edge of the road just as the Juggernaut is passing over them. Running up the embankment, they spot a ladder on the exterior of the vehicle and fire their grapplers, pulling themselves up onto it. Um, it's a blink and you'll miss it moment, but uh, Wrecker is actually shown. They use the same animation asset. It's the pistol. Nice. Wrecker doesn't carry a pistol. He's never carried a pistol through the entire show, but we need to grapple. So he's got one, which I thought was kind of neat. Nice. Even if it is kind of a continuity flub. He was hiding in his backpack. He just didn't. Sure. We'll say, we'll say that. Yeah. He doesn't use okay. it a lot because he hates hiking. Okay. <laughs> That's true. We're going to, we're going to be reminded of that this episode too. Okay, inside the cockpit, an alarm sounds, and the driver says that their sensors have been tripped, so he dispatches the co-driver to go and check it out. Taking his rifle, he exits the cockpit and climbs a ladder leading to an exterior hatch on the top of the vehicle. Well, then we cut back to the cockpit where the door slides open and an unseen person moves in. The driver asks, anything? Only it's Wrecker, and he answers, yep. Mm -hmm. Startled, the driver turns <laughs> just in time to get a face full of Wrecker's fists, knocking him out. Wrecker calls. Yep. <laughs> Clear. 
as he moves the limp trooper out of the driver's seat. That's the second time this season I've laughed. <laughs> yep. Hunter, yeah. so go ahead. Kind of weird, though, that they had sensors on the outside of this tank. Uh, I don't know. Is it? A little bit. Like, you know, last time or last episode, uh, Clone X was sneaking into the ship without tripping anything. Different ship. Different ship, different thing, I guess. Different ship. I mean, this has been used as a, as a dedicated prisoner transport, so maybe it's you would have something like that I guess so. for a possibility of a prison an break escape or an or... escape. Yeah, I, I feel like that that tracks. Yeah, it makes more sense. <clears throat> Hunter and Crosshair move in, and the former takes the controls while the latter taps the door frame to the prisoner compartment. It crackles with static electricity, and Crosshair notes that it's magnetically sealed, but that doesn't seem to bother him. In fact, Crosshair seems inspired as he asks Wrecker, you remember Plan 55? It takes the big man a second to recall, but he does. And then drawing his blaster, he says to Crosshair, waiting on you. On the word go, Crosshair throws open the door and the two rush to the prisoner compartment. Inside the compartment, a sensor beeps before the door slides open. The stormtroopers are surprised and they all turn to engage but Crosshair aims at the wall and fires a single shot. The bolt ricochets off the wall several times, killing four of the troopers. Then Wrecker, <laughs> then Wrecker pokes out from behind him, dropping the remaining two. He's back, baby. <laughs> That's what I thought. The prisoners all remain silent, all except Rampart, who, recognizing Crosshair, addresses him, CT-9904? Crosshair answers, you remembered how touching. Activating his helmet comm, Crosshair tells Hunter, the target's secured. Rampart, now incensed, the target? What is this? Are you here to kill me? <laughs> Crosshair says, it's tempting, but no, we're not. Wrecker clears his throat to get Crosshair's attention. Waving his arm in a sweeping gesture at the rest of the compartment, he asks, what about them? Cut to an exterior shot of the juggernaut stopping on the road. The back door opens and Wrecker is there waving at the prisoners as he orders them off the transport. He yells at them, go, go. And they're they all, all still go. wearing their binders too. They all run that? in different directions. <laughs> and they're all, and a <laughs> couple of them right down the middle of the road. I yep. noticed. <laughs> yeah. I'm like, I didn't put it together. I get it in the next scene that it all comes together. But my first thought was you couldn't take their cuffs off. Mm -hmm. It's cool <laughs> and loot. <laughs> yeah. That's the inspiration for this episode. Yeah. That is legitimately the inspiration for this episode. It was yeah. in the it was in the episode guide this week. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Run for it. Oh, okay. Um, supposed to be eating the eggs. <laughs> I just want to talk about magnetically sealed because this is cool. Um, obviously, magnetically sealed. We all remember the scene from the trash compactor in A New Hope where Luke is screaming at Leia. Will you forget it? I already tried it. It's magnetically sealed, which is cool. I actually looked up magnetic seals, um, and there is surprisingly a canon entry for this. Hmm. Magnetic seals commonly used in high security applications in Star Wars to ensure that whatever is locked cannot be open. The trade-off is that the magnetic field also repels blaster bolts. This, I'm sure I knew this, but had just forgotten it. Um, according to Kane and Jarrus, they are also lightsaber proof, hmm. which makes magnetic seals uh, ranks the right up there with ray shielding. Hmm. Which Crazy. I was kind of cool. Yeah. Yeah. He says uh, in an episode of rebels in season four, uh, 4.8 crawler commanders, they're chasing uh, oh, this yeah. guy through the giant crawler and he li literally radios in. That is the actual subtitles from Disney plus. I can't cut through either. They're magnetically sealed. Nice. So yeah, magnetic seals, lightsaber proof. I'm sure I knew that at the time of the episode and went that school, but that's something that we haven't really seen very much of. It's no. used very sparingly. Absolutely. It is at the guard tower, a technician, uh, by the way, it's that same animation model with the gunnery helmet on the weird uniform. <laughs> <laughs> a technician turns to the warden and tells him that one of the transports has made an unscheduled stop. The warden, not too phased by the news, orders the tech to run a diagnostic of their comms. Back on the juggernaut, Wrecker gives the all clear, and Hunter gets the vehicle rolling again. Wrecker rejoins Crosshair in the prisoner compartment, where he says, that should distract the Empire for a bit. Looking up at the clones from his seat, Rampart asks, and what about me? Crosshair hisses at him, 
you're fine where you, right where you are. But Rampart is a shrewd man, and he puts it together on his own. If you're not here to execute me, and you're not letting me go, then you must need something from me. And Crosshair just lays it out plainly. Tent is base. Where is it? Rampart asks how much it's worth to them. Crosshair says he's not in a position to bargain, but Rampart disagrees with him, saying that he'll talk, but only after they've gotten him off of Erebus. He adds, you don't get what you want if I don't get what I want. Um, does anybody think for a second that this guy is looking to be reinstated in any capacity? Not at this point, no. Do you think that's a possibility down the road? No. Like, no. hey, look what I've done. Not when you're like, arrested in front of the entire when he's been this he's been the scapegoat for everything yeah Yeah, okay yeah he just wants freedom at this point i would think i think that's right now conversely do we see an agent callus in here somewhere is there a flip for this character or is he just completely unscrupulous and on his own now that would just be too many kaijus again (laughs) (laughs) agreed agreed yeah like it's the devil you know literally that's like that's I, yeah, I, I agree. It's also that. out of left. I didn't expect, you know, there's a, a, a bunch of characters that could have showed up. The uh, Rampart was not on my radar at no, all. No, no. I, I even expected Sid to pop up maybe to get some closure there. Oh, but. that's, that's a pretty interesting. I still expect that we'll get some closure there. She might be part of the cavalry. Who knows? Probably. Maybe there is a, a, a silver lining in there or a, a golden heart uh, after all, but I guess we won't find out for at least another couple episodes well she just gave them up for a second time so yes but it was under duress mm-hmm. yeah. it wasn't just like oh yeah well she might only have one claw yeah really well then crosshair's calm goes off and it's hunter telling him that they're approaching the bridge and he orders wrecker to man the cannon the rampart just stares at crosshair and smirks at him i thought that was kind of cool a little smile <laughs> In the guard tower, the technician informs the warden that he believes that that transport one's comms are in fact being jammed. This gets the warden's attention and he goes, he gets out of his seat, uh, joins the technician at his station and listens to the muffled static coming in over the air. Drawing up his own macro binoculars, he sees the turbo tank approaching the bridge. The technician tells the warden uh, that it's increasing speed and he thinks it's been compromised. Taking action, the warden orders the bridge to be sealed off. And for the gunships to be deployed, he also orders that a second juggernaut be rerouted to intercept them. Klaxons ring out as the warden moves to the other side of the tower to get a visual on the second tank. It rolls into view on the near side of the bridge. Inside the cockpit, the co-driver relays that they have new orders to hold the bridge. So the driver shoves the throttle forward and races to get there. Back inside the tower, the warden activates the controls that operate the physical barriers on the bridge, and they begin to slide towards one another to form several rows of walls. You know what I noticed? They uh, TKs are doing a lot of heavy lifting. They haven't specialized yet. They're driving the the juggernaut. They they fly the ships. they're, They're flying the ships, yeah. Is this... Again, I, I hate to be the nanana poo poo, but is that just a case of like, it's a bad guy. It works to serve the story. We don't need to animate a pilot if we already have this bad guy animation model. It may. Um, it may. I would love, I would love a story explanation for this. Um, With a lack of a clone army, you've got to get people in fast to fill all those roles. You do, but like conscripts generally aren't well trained at anything. It's like put a gun in their hand and go. And that's and how we, we know that don't hit their target. That, we exactly. know the empire has reg troops that don't dress like this. Like I w- yeah, was yeah. always understood. I, I, I thought anyway, that the, the TKs were the elite troopers. I always felt that way too. They're, I mean, Obi-Wan's line, only Imperial storm troopers are this precise. Right. And then they sort of like become like the rank and file after a fashion, after a while, you know, like by the time we get to solo, which is, you know, rise of the empire, same sort of general timeline as this, we see regular army troopers. Well, that's the There's... one that kind of fixed the idea for me that, okay, these, oh, those, yeah. those, that's like a heavily armored naval, you know, but you sort of like, oh, they're just manning the death star. So that's your average that's a private, yeah. right? Yeah. But then yeah. you then you realize, no, these are like shock troops. Like, yeah, stormtroopers. Exactly. That's what they're meant to be. Is, is supposed to be shock troopers. But you're right. They're they're doing 
a little bit of everything. <laughs> sure. Which are. is kind of, kind of bizarre. All right. So yeah, um, the barriers begin to slide, uh, slide towards each other, forming uh, several rows of walls. Uh, Wrecker shouts, Hunter, they're stealing off the bridge. So Hunter guns it and actually drives through the barricades. Uh, the juggernaut's enormous tires handle them as if they were small speed bumps. Boom, 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 boom. But then Transport 2 is on the other side of the bridge racing towards them, and they open fire with their chin-mounted blasters. The juggernaut's armor shrugs it off like it was nothing, while Wrecker shouts, Is that all you've got? And grabbing the control yoke, he aims the top-mounted cannon, and he returns fire. The uh, stormtroopers are jostled in their seats by the impact, but their juggernaut is just as armored, and they keep rolling. I had to do this. There's no way that I could not do this as an <laughs> homage to everything that is holy. Well, the Empire's next attack might be a little more effective as uh, twin rocket launchers oh. open on either side of the vehicle. And Together? Fires, <laughs> fires a volley Full that would... Missile solo. <laughs> fires a volley that would satisfy any mecha anime fan. Oh, you're the best. <laughs> At our heroes. I loved it so much. I counted. There's like 30 rockets there. It's so good. Yeah. Shout out to our friends at uh, Reflex Point, a Robotech podcast. You probably can appreciate this. Oh, buddy. Yeah. Um, amazingly, the top mounted rear turret spins forward and unleashes a gout of anti missile fire, taking down almost all of the rockets. And of the ones that do get through, only a handful strike the juggernaut, heaving it to one side and causing it to glance off the side rail of the bridge. So I had a little problem with the animation assets here. Just and it's maybe it's just tiny minor complaint, but Sure, sure. Did you guys like find that the explosions were almost too realistic compared oh, I, to the painterly? I love that aspect of it. I thought it looked really good. It, it almost pulled me out and nothing really does because everything's so painterly, but they seemed like yeah, yeah. to break that uncanny valley for me. They looked so hyper realistic it looked movie quality to next me. to the painterly you know yeah yeah yeah. it was a little distracting but Less still beautiful i well, i loved it and that's you're absolutely right i'm sitting there watching this and i see the and i'm like i did the same thing Full missile <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah big time oh, i loved it i loved it so much okay so um yeah hunter regains control and he points he points it back down the middle, uh, but the oncoming stormtroopers can't see them through the cloud of thick black smoke. Hunter says the armor is too strong, and he tells Wrecker to take out their wheels. Returning the favor, Wrecker deploys their rocket launchers, and aiming low, he fires a salvo. The stormtroopers try to dodge, but the bridge is too narrow. Most of the rockets find their mark, and in a violent explosion, the two forwardmost wheels are blown off, sending the juggernaut into a skid as its nose drops to the bridge. Hunter yells, hold on, as he jams the throttle as far forward as it can go, using the disabled juggernaut like a ramp. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't not do that. I saw that and I'm like, wow. I, I mean, almost like I can hear Waylon Jennings. You might be thinking, what's going on here? <laughs> <laughs> them batch boys sure are in it. <laughs> them, them batch boys. <laughs> Sorry. I had to. No, I was saying this this very thing to Doug. I was like, if if they did do uh, a, a Star Wars property where there were zero stakes and it could be adventure yeah, yeah. of the month. Sure. And, and keep me engaged. It would be something along the lines of the Dukes of hazard or, you know, where it's just like a couple of smugglers getting by a couple of good old boys. Uh, yeah. 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 But, totally, but no totally. stakes. Like if you wanted to have a thread that moved the, like some kind of big story forward, yeah, but yeah, that, yeah. you know, but, but that's the kind of thing, you know, don't give me the auspice of we're we're doing great big huge things and then yep. and then fight fifteen Godzillas. <laughs> now, but that I could get behind. <laughs> I loved it. I mean, as soon as I saw it, I'm like, wow. There's a like, it's a total Dukes of Hazard. Oh yeah. Yep. Big time. <laughs> In the back, both Crosshair and Rampart are thrown to the floor by the impact. 
one of the unconscious troopers blasters uh, lay just a foot or so away from rampart well grabbing it he rolls onto his back ready to shoot crosshair but a shot rings out uh knocking the weapon from his hands crosshair gets to his feet and stands over rampart with his rifle pointed at him rampart indignantly remarks oh please you're not going to kill me and looking down at him crosshair uh, replies not yet and then just stuns him <laughs> get a feeling that since he missed the target since he fell short with that tracking beacon he's not about to miss anything else so like that's after that that's bank shot after that shot right out of his hand lightning speed that is a very interesting uh, uh thought and i kind of wondered i didn't go there i actually thought that the the bank shot worked because it was such close quarters that there was no like like the angles were less full complicated. of prisoners it's true. I mean, the one blast did kind of poof, past Rampart's head. Um, yeah, I'll give you that one. I'll definitely give you that one. But he did have his like, I didn't want to go back there. Mm -hmm. So nope, it's, we're, not out, of the, it's we're not out of the woods with that yet. But at the same time, he now knows that it's mental as well. Like, and yes, presumably he does, yeah. he's been with Omega working on that. Yep. You know, possibly. Yeah at the prison two squads of stormtroopers rush to board a pair of gunships at the same time the warden tries to close the gates at the near uh, side of the bridge but the batch blast their way through with more rockets no sooner do they cross the bridge do the gunships rise up over the ridge in front of them and begin to open fire hunter cuts the throttle and skids the juggernaut hard left barreling down a narrow dirt road that runs down the edge of the chasm crosshair carries the unconscious rampart into the cockpit Placing him on the floor, he joins his brothers for an yeah. update. Hunter activates his helmet comm to let Fee know they could really use a pickup now, but all that comes back is garbled static. <laughs> when he walked in, I actually went back, I replayed it three or four times because he runs in so fast. I'm like, did he just like, like toss him off, <laughs> dump him? He didn't. He actually like makes a point to like sort of bend over and let him down. He do throw it, his body around quite a bit at the end. <laughs> <laughs> never toss a dwarf <laughs> nobody <laughs> tosses a dwarf anybody can toss a rampart toss rampart over the rampart <laughs> that joke wrote itself he's so weekend heavy when he's unconscious <laughs> weekend at edamons <laughs> uh yeah cross uh yes elliot is uh, static okay the gunships, now hot in pursuit, begin to close the distance, close enough that they open their crew compartments in preparation to deploy troopers. Wrecker swivels the rear turret and blasts the nearest gunship. The, uh, the burst clips one of its wings, and the ship veers off. Suddenly, the wing snaps off, and it spirals uncontrollably, crashing into the valley floor. The second gunship blasts the chasm wall, causing large pieces of rocky debris to fall on the juggernaut which is enough of a distraction for the pilot uh, to be able to position his ship over the tank and drop his troops on its back. The troopers quickly deploy explosive charges and neutralize both top-mounted cannons. With the cannons offline, they know there are troopers on the tank's hull, so Wrecker and Crosshair prepare to rebel, repel borders. But Hunter swerves the tank back and forth as hard as he can, sending all but one of the troops over the edge. Fortunately for uh, one of the one trooper, he's able to grab hold of a ladder as he rolls off the side. Unfortunately, <laughs> it's the side closest to the chasm wall, and he's <laughs> scraped off by a rocky outcropping. It's the opposite <laughs> of uh, Indiana Jones there. <laughs> it, it is, really. But how many of those TKs do you ever think boarded a, a, a speeding juggernaut from a moving uh, dropship? Like, that's you gotta not, think these guys are green as hell, right? Like conscripts, right? Learn that on a shooting range. <laughs> <laughs> My armor doesn't fit quite right. If they these are not the clones, scene. like no, they're conscripted troops. And you think like if they're you know, privates and corporals, these are guys that have got like maybe less than a year in the military. And this yeah, is a cushy you know? gig. <laughs> this is yeah. like okay, we're just gonna escort these prisoners to this camp and back. Yeah, and suddenly yeah, yeah. we're mounting moving vehicles. Yeah, but if they have the same mentality as the two guides in the guard tower, they're like, all right, finally some action. Oh, that's so, true. Yeah, I mean, that's, oh, that's crap, true. this is more than I signed I, up You know, for. that's funny, though. This is this comes from my own real, real world experience. When I was uh, transferring what was like rotating out of Afghanistan and the new guys were coming in, I can remember one of the young guys, and he couldn't have been more than 18 to 20, and he was like, I couldn't believe it. He's like, I can't wait to get in the shit. 
I can't wait to get in this shit. And I'm just like, dude, but that, that's that, my point is that that is a real attitude. Maybe yeah. we'll get some action next time. People crave it. It's weird. Yeah. It is a very Until weird they're thing. they're standing in it. Until well, you get yeah, crushed yeah. against the side of a cliff. Yeah. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, at least his insides were contained by his armor. <laughs> that's true. Uba now with the juggernaut free and clear of troopers, it's up to the pilot of the remaining gunship to stop them. So he fires a volley of a blaster fire at the tank and manages to take out the rear axle. By the way, this shot, the over top, uh, uh, looking over the, the, the so tube. good. So here's, here's where I have an issue with this. You know, we've seen this angle before on one of these, when they actually used the two giant missile launchers, that were capable of stopping a capital ship. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they shot down like the central balls of the trade Federation battleships with one of these. That's right. Why didn't they use the missile? Launcher? <laughs> well, then they'd have to rebuild the road. Well, then their story would be over because the guys would be dead, but that too. that's besides the point. They will have neutralized the threat, but then they'd have, you know, months and months of rebuilding the roads. And that's true. That is true. Who wants to do that? Uh, fires a volley of blaster fire, manages to take out the rear axle. Now, alarms ring out in the cockpit as Hunter explains, controls are dead! Up ahead, the valley road makes a sharp bend to the right, uh, but there's nothing any of them can do about it. Wrecker shouts, we're running out of road! For what good it will do. But then the gunship explodes in a hail of blaster fire, and the Providence drops in behind the juggernaut. Wait. Over the comm, Feel calls, uh, calls out, not exactly a stealth exit, boys! Hunter shouts, let's move. And grabbing Rampart, the three of them climb to the hull, up to the hull of the tank. Now, Fee uh, paces the tank, getting as close as she can without putting her ship into the wall, and then drops the ramp. She does actually scrape it a couple of times, mm -hmm. uh, knocks a bit of debris off. So it's very tight quarters here. She then drops the ramp. Crosshair and Hunter are first to jump across. Then Wrecker tosses Rampart's limp body <laughs> to them, and they pull him in. Uh, Wrecker, not convinced that he can make the leap, he shouts for them to move closer, but there's no room and there's no time. Hunter yells at him, hurry up, jump! And just as the juggernaut nosedives off the valley road, the big man hurls himself into the void. It turns out his reservations about jumping weren't totally unfounded as he falls short, uh, grabbing the end of the ramp with most of his body dangling over the edge. But with Hunter and Crosshair right there, they quickly pull him up and the three of them amble back into the ship uh, to the relative safety of the Providence as it uh, I, casually. I thought that's how we were going to lose a guy. That just falling. Yeah, I, I was like, no, <laughs> I really did. I was like, oh, no. Well, I'm glad that they didn't. Stakes are that high. Like, yeah, yeah. And we've we've been expecting, I've been expecting character death this whole season. Mm -hmm. um, hasn't happened yet. Fast no. and furious moment. That's true. That's true. I'm glad in, in uh, hindsight and in retrospect that they did not uh, kill another character by falling. No, we've, we've had that. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't need another fall. Yes. Uh, the relative safety of the Providence as it casually lifts its nose and glides away through the cloud cover. As the, uh, Providence pulls away from Erebus crosshair wakes up rampart, literally just kicks him, wake up. Um, Having fulfilled his demand to get him off the planet, Crosshair demands the coordinates for Tantis. Rampart tells him that it's more complicated than that. Hunter asks, complicated how? <laughs> well, Rampart tells him that well, no one knows the location because it was designed that way. But he thinks he may know a way around that. Crosshair, not impressed with the answer, demands that they tell them uh, now, or they'll just drop him back at the Erebus prison. But Rampart knows they need him. And playing coy, he says, now, now, no need for threats. After all, we're in this together. <laughs> I just felt so creepy when he said that, too. Yeah, yeah. Like, oh, my God. I mean, they know that they're via orbit. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. We'll just walk the airlock. You walk right the airlock. At the Tantus base, Omega sits on the stool in the lab while Emery studies a readout on her data pad. Omega looks up as Emery moves to the console to look at Omega's profile on the screen beside the centrifuge. The uppermost sample lights up with a yellow light, and Emery glances uneasily back at Omega. Just then, Dr. Hemlock arrives to ask about Omega's test results. She tells him, 
Omega's blood sample yielded a favorable M count replication. Hemlock looks at Omega as he remarks, as expected. Looking up at the doctor, Omega asks, well, what does that mean? And Hemlock tells her, I'll show you, then turns to leave the lab. Omega shoots a worried look at Emery before following the doctor. Turning back to the console, Emery lets out a heavy sigh. Hemlock and Omega arrive at the antechamber to the vault. Omega looks around at how heavily guarded it is. And as they walk across the room, Hemlock asks, Did you know an individual's M count cannot be directly replicated? Attempts have been made, but each time the levels degraded. And so we experimented. Reaching the double doors uh, under the control room, Hemlock opens them, revealing the ray shielded corridor. The first ray shield retracts, and Hemlock gestures for Omega to continue walking. She asks, Where are you taking me? He tells her plainly, The vault. Continuing down the corridor, the ray shields retract and expand in sequence, and the doctor continues his explanation. We tried various methods, mixing samples from our other test subjects, but nothing worked. Until we combined your sample with one of our M count specimens. At the other end of the ray shielded corridor, the double doors slide open, revealing another smaller antechamber guarded by more commandos. Hemlock tells Omega that she is a vital piece of the work they do here. Then the glass doors to the vault slide open, and Omega is stunned to see Eva, Max, and the Pantoran girl each sitting at a round table. The Pantoran girl plays a hovering block stacking game, not unlike Jenga, while Jax sits with his head down. Eva, who's playing with a hollow puzzle, looks up at the newcomer. Omega asks, who are they? Hemlock calls them the rest of the puzzle and announces that this is Omega's new home. The glass doors snap shut, startling her, and she just stands there with Hemlock looking around the room while Imperial scientists look down on them and the other children from an overhead control room. Cut to black. That is our episode. No sign of the bear. No, there was no sign of, uh, yeah, Baron, yeah. Um, I mean, he's, he's a little, I, do you think there's more with Baron? I think there is probably, I think there's more with all of them, to be honest. Did you guys, uh, catch any of the other, uh, people talking about this episode this week? No, I did. I, uh, there was an interesting, uh, I saw a, a clip this week. Um, uh, go back and rewatch some of the episodes when we get to Tantus, they've shown it several times. I don't know if we, we were, we knew this. I just think we'd forgotten about it. There's a second facility in the in the next yeah. mountain over. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I think it's the same facility and they're linked underground. Absolutely. 100%. Mm. You know, we're when we talked about Narhina 5 and Andor, like each of the prisons, were they all building, you know, spigots or or whatever those things were or was yeah. each one building something else? Right. Is each mountain facility a different thing? I don't think so. I think it's all his, honestly. The Emperor's secret vault. Exactly. Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, exactly. And if exactly. we've only and like we were kind of shocked to see, you know, oh look, we've got extra vaults down here. Uh, yeah, it's not just yeah. the one with all the weird stuff. <laughs> now we got the kid vault, uh, the we do, yeah, the stasis vault. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. And Presumably, then... Joris uh, Sabaoth is around here somewhere. <laughs> Are you going that far? I mean, do you want to go that far? I kind of do. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I feel like we're how many degrees away from uh, from a uh, Snoke? Are we? I, I was, so. I was tempted. I was like, t- I'm taking the calling Omega Proto Snoke. <laughs> <laughs> Proto Snoke. Like, I mean, that's, it seems to be, that's where we're getting the juice from to make, to make that Maybe. item. Right. Maybe. Like, yeah. Um, overall now I'm going to come back to it. Um, is this a filler episode? Yes or no? No. If you had to just in one word, Andy, you're a no. No. Hank. Um, it has filler episode elements, but the bookends prevent it from being a filler episode. I'm with you both on that. Not a filler episode to me, yeah. even though it did not drive the bigger story forward. I, I think the name the bookends the certainly episode. did. Yeah. And now that Omega is up to speed on, on uh, necromancer or somewhat up to speed anyway, more up to speed. Yeah, but I think the episode title is kind of like a double-edged thing. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. we the Juggernaut Turbo Tank, but we are also about to, like, Juggernaut speed towards the end. I also we are barreling towards the end. You couldn't help but think about Juggernaut in terms of the Imperial War Machine itself or the Empire. It's this unstoppable 
course. you know, it's just, it's rolling now and, uh, it's going to be a while before we ever get out from underneath of it. Yeah. And maybe not at all. Got one from Doug coming in. Uh, Doug says it's been done. <laughs> not sure the context there, Doug, you want to just, you want to let me know what you're meaning by that? It's all been done before. Uh, that's true. And it will be again mm -hmm. next week. What do you think? Into the breach. Into the breach. Hmm. That's next week's episode. Well, I think they're going to have to get into uh, somewhere with Rampart so he can execute whatever ploy he's working on. Yeah. I mean, you know, are they going to go to another, like another Imperial facility? Because Rampart doesn't, <laughs> you know, obviously we've got this. I know somebody who knows somebody thing mm. you know yeah, now he knows a guy yeah exactly but remember that Django fett harry hired a changeling who hired a robot who that's right yeah <laughs> count yep. dooku hired a guy who <laughs> oh jumping on the roof of a juggernaut it's been done it, no it, it it certainly has um <laughs> yeah it, it certainly has i feel like you know like the episode of the, and I know this week's episode did kind of, you know, harken back to the episode of the Mandalorian where they had to go and get Megs Mayfeld because you remember all your uh, protocols and codes, right? Yeah. And he was like, I need a terminal. Hmm. I'm like, well, this sounds familiar. Are they going to literally like stick Rampart in a uniform, chuck a helmet on him and then make him go and you remember your codes and protocols, get the information. Are they going to Migs Mayfeld Rampart in this next episode? Or like, um. Uh i mean that's uh what's her face captain phasma it's you know it's it's a it's a trope for sure i yeah. i think that the difference here is that like like rampart has genuine evil in him yeah like so he wouldn't hesitate to you know well i don't think he's trying to get back on the good graces of the empire it probably wouldn't do any good but no. i don't think he would hesitate to cut a throat to get a leg up that uh, much in I, any fashion yeah, yeah. I could see him being making the anonymous, you know, the the Crime Stopper tip phone call. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Hey, yeah. I know where they call the stormtroopers just as well, he's yeah. stealing fish. That's yeah. right, as he's like literally like bye bye <laughs> into the breach. Um, I think about how the the word into the breach, uh, the phrase gets tossed around. Certainly, from my own experience, I can remember the first time that I had to teach a class in front of a group of students. You're in you're in the breach. You know, you're, you are now the, the focal point of a much larger group of people. Could it be something like that where all eyes are on this, you know, one of them or them in, in general could be, who knows? Um, certainly the, I like chewing on the titles. I like sort of guessing at where we're going with that. I feel like this week was a, had enough excitement for me. I feel like next week, I think we're going to get another I'm going out in a limb. We're going to get a banger. I think I certainly I, they, so. they're they, all going to be that way. They, me, right? they, yeah. I don't, I can't, I can't see them not being all that way. Yeah. 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 <laughs> With just three episodes left again, mm -hmm. you have to ask the question, how much more can the audience, are they going to keep getting shorter and shorter well, and shorter? <laughs> the last episode is going to be 10 minutes, right? <laughs> <laughs> 10 minutes because everything happens in episode 14. It's just like a 10 minute wrap. That's right. So with three left, we've got next week into the breach. And then we've got our two part finale. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, I can't remember the first uh, title. And then it's uh, the cavalry the cavalry, has, the cavalry arrived. has arrived. So yeah, we are definitely coming to a head. We may not get off of, maybe it'll, you know, finish on Tantus. I kind of figure that's what's mm -hmm. going to happen. Is there going to be, we haven't talked about clone revolt in a while. Nope. No. What do we think there? You think the clones are going to rise up and break out? It could certainly be. an attempt. We're going to find out why there are no clones just walking around everywhere in the future. We certainly don't even, we don't really have a clear idea how many clones are being held at Tantus. We know there are some. No, you know, that but the they do, they, they say more than we knew. Yeah. They do yeah. say there's way more than we thought. I think that there's going to be a sizable number of them that the escape is going to hinge on needing all those numbers to get sort of lost in the shuffle. Yeah. If there's an escape of any kind. One thing I did read this week, and I don't know if it yep, amounts yep. to a hill of beans because everything's taken with a grain of salt, but I have heard rumors of an animated series about Rex and Gregor and Wolf continuing oh. this narrative. What that would bridge the gap between now and when we meet them in rebels. Yeah. 
Well, that could be a, that could be a fun romp. Well, don't forget, like Omega has stated it over and over. We left our brothers there, and Rex yep. is yep. all over that. And now Wolf knows that they're there too. Wolf hasn't, but Wolf, but, you know, like again, we've said it before. Hank, you said it. Hmm. Wolf is still, you know, he's not. He still got some Kool Aid in him. By the time we get to Rebels, even in Rebels, he still right. rats them out. He calls the Empire. Hey, I got a Jedi here. Yeah, but that's so, a Jedi, not a clone brother. Oh no, that's true. That is true. So he's, you know, semi unbrainwashed. Yes. Interesting. I mean, having seen Asajj Ventress, having yep. you know, I don't think we're done with the this level of animated Star Wars by a long shot. Ewan McGregor has said he would come back for another season of Kenobi. Mm. Perhaps okay. another season of Kenobi could focus more on the path. And that could uh, be well, they 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 still have the original script for the film, which was not what they used to make the show. Oh because it focused cool. on his relationship with Luke. Hmm. And uh right. this is a short story about Luke goes to confront some low-level thugs about stealing water taxes but they work for jabba and oh right right and so he ends up so there's all kinds of little you know but what they did was they wanted to turn it on its head and and they wrote the leia story arc which was beautiful i loved it in, in my opinion but so there there's still all the story that they were they were supposed to tell and didn't and with that uh the, the very final scene is just like that. It's got sequel written all over it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I just think there's enough, there are enough breadcrumbs in uh, season one, especially having the, the Quinlan Voss reference that maybe we can see, maybe we can get our live action massage ventures and that now there's been no announcement. We don't know if there's going to be any more Kenobi. So it's probably going to be in the baloney verse movie where mm. all of this stuff comes together. But man, like, can it just happen like tomorrow? <laughs> Please. Please do it. Can we just do it tomorrow. <laughs> That's what uh, uh, yeah. Lauren and I were joking. Why can't there be one X-Men 97 episode every hour? Oh my God. For the yeah. rest of our lives. <laughs> just Seriously. Once an hour, I want a new episode. <laughs> <laughs> I really wish that. Uh, Get drawing. <laughs> that we were not so uh, embroiled in what we do with Star Wars. Because I, would I take, really would have loved. I to would live. loved. I mean, I. I may, it may be worth it for us to take one episode and, and take just a, a like, look at let's the entire, just talk about what's happened to the whole series, the, the whole series, yeah, because yeah, it would, yeah. we'd probably be doing it a disservice. I, in my opinion, I feel the same way. The best thing Marvel's done in, in more than a decade. Um, so I, yeah, I, I'm just, this last episode was just such a like, oh. um, Oh, Doug's got a great point too. Uh, I just finished this last night. Uh, the new Fallout series on Prime Video, uh, based on, uh, on the video game franchise from Bethesda uh, Softworks, but very good, by the way. You've seen it all? Yes, I watched the whole thing. It's only eight episodes. Okay. About yeah, to check um, it out. Haven't, haven't yet, but yeah, can't wait. Here. As somebody who's never played a Fallout game, I did not feel like I was completely out, out of lunch. No, yeah. not at all. I quite enjoyed it. And I feel by the end of the season, I had a very good grasp of what was going on. Kim, yeah. same way. My wife, she's, we've never played any of those games. Yeah, Loved it. Either. Thought it was great. Four is so good. I, I believe that honestly, this series if you were ever going to check one of them out, I would just jump into Fallout 4. So I just read today that whatever the new Fallout game is has been delayed because the, C the series has done so well. Bethesda has now prioritized the next gen uh, um, upgrade to Fallout 4 hmm. uh, over the new game. So, so good. Very I'm good. led to believe that the series is based heavily on the events of Fallout 4. It is. That's so, true. Just from okay the trailer. Yeah. I'm okay with that. And uh, Walton Goggins as the, the ghoul is the standout performance, if you ask me. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> He's very good. Okay, so. Wow. We are uh, at the end of another one. Uh, the fan, Our little fan bat show here. I want to thank everybody who's uh, turned up week after week. And uh, if you're new to the show, thank you for uh, tuning in. I hope that you've enjoyed our little show that we like to do. We've got three more of these to go. And then we are right into, we might have a, we might have a bit of a break between this and tales and, of the empire tales, but that's, that's our next star Wars project that we're going to May four. Yeah. Yeah. Star is Wars it, day. Is it all dropping at once? 
I believe we were getting yeah. the whole thing at once. They so we're going to have to Tales figure out. We... Yes, they did. Yeah. Yeah. And we did that in three episodes, I believe. Yeah. Because we broke it down into the, the, yeah. Well, it was for writing purposes. It really yeah. was only two story arcs. Yeah. Because we had yeah. the Ahsoka and the. And, uh, and ultimately, Tales of the Empire is only two story arcs that sort right. of converge. But it, it, depending on the number of episodes, uh, you know, in order to write it all, we may have to do the same thing. But sure that's what we are going to be doing and i would love to do some x-men stuff i think that would mm. be hordes of fun tiny Ooh. gap between that and the acolyte so there is so look forward to maybe doing some more short shorter uh pre-recorded stuff uh for the channel that uh i still have my weapons of star wars series that i'm mm -hmm. wanting to get back to <laughs> people love those ones they do yeah people love them quite a bit so uh, i'm looking forward to getting back to that and were we talking about the Morgan Elsbeth figure last week and how it had spiked up on value? Oh, uh, I don't know, but you sent over a, uh, an Amazon link. Yeah. Cause Amazon has it on sale right now for 25 bucks. Um, I ordered her and I had her like two days later. So like super fast. Um, she looks fantastic. The portrait on her looks just, just lovely. I quite like it. Mm -hmm. Um, no accessories. No, none, but she does come with two closed hands that are just begging for the Beskar spear. So if you have that version of Din Djarin, the Mandalorian, um, that's what spear. I would do. I would give her the spear. Yeah. Yeah. He's got his other stuff. Absolutely. There is also, I should have brought it over. There is a basic three and three quarter line that just came out. And in it, one of the figures is Grogu in the season three Mandalorian season three pram. Mm. That pram uh, and the figure are almost exactly the same scale as the black series Grogu. So if, you, <laughs> yeah, if you're yeah, looking for a funny. pram, if you're looking for a pram and you don't want to spend the crazy amounts of money to get one of the, pram, the, the accessory pack or the version of the Mandalorian that came with the season one pram, mm -hmm. I believe so. um, for $10 Canadian, you can't go wrong. And in fact, it's now on my shelf, uh, as part of my black series collection. And if you're in Canada, there's also the option of the dollar ammo one. Right, it's, the, the, it's a little bit bigger, yeah. but yeah, six, five bucks. The, it comes with a pram, so you can't go wrong. That was the six-inch uh, basic figure yes. line, which I used the head. The head of that uh, Mandalorian figure is now on my Black Series Mandalorian because it's a better, uh, better proportion. Um, that pram is the season two pram. That's the one built by Queel. Yeah, um, and it works as well. Yeah. So there's okay. options. You could get all three prams if you want. <laughs> I got. I don't know what the one I have is the uh, orange season one prim maybe yellow uh white with orange uh, trim he comes with it yeah yeah so that is the that is the season one um so that that is pram one and pram three uh by the way if you haven't been paying attention grogu has had no less than four prams <laughs> one that the one that he they found him in he also comes I, oh then they, they got uh, a second one that looks like an egg like that one but it's the pa yeah. package of the cookies oh i like that then there's that one then there's the one that Queen yeah. makes and then the season three one for yeah. a total of four. Yeah, because the one gets destroyed by. Uh, yeah, when they uh, do the the fake fish thing, they do the fake delivery, right? Well, there's that one. The one that so the one that he was found in, which is like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Yes. Um, they do the fake delivery. It's empty, so they never go back for it. Queel builds him the all silver one. Yeah. That one gets destroyed by the the the, munchy the thing mama core. Ship. With uh, our longshoreman Melon Calabari, that's right. Long we still shore, don't have a figure for long yet. Shore longshore Mon. Longshore Mon. Um, then they basically rebuild the season one pram into that one, the white one with the orange accents, and mm -hmm. it gets. I can't remember how it gets uh, nerfed. Mm. But then by season three, he's got the uh, the all. Cool. Round IG 12, does that count as a pram? <laughs> <laughs> His mecha suit, <laughs> mecha Grogu. There you go. So good. All right. Yeah. Well, listen, everybody, thanks for, uh, for tuning in. Thanks for hanging out with us. Uh, again, it's been an, uh, an awesome uh, week. Thank you once again. Andy and I will be back on Tuesday night for more uh, random fandom. There's a, a lot going on. Uh, let the let the OJ jokes commence mm -hmm. <laughs> because that's that you can't help but talk about that actually brad williams i guess he tweeted day of and then he's got another comedy bit out now because his joke got stolen and oh. recycled without anybody giving credit oh boy so he's like well you know what in a way it's kind of a fitting tribute <laughs> <That's so good. laughs> one of the best ones i saw on twitter was uh uh and hopefully it doesn't offend or trigger anybody but it was it was, it was quite funny it was like 
whenever somebody famous dies, they always drum up something from their past that nobody knew about that totally ruins their image. <laughs> I wonder what they're going to find on this guy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hilarious. Okay. Anything else you guys want to want to say before we uh, say goodnight to everybody? I don't think so. I think we're okay. Yeah. I think we covered it. All right. All right, everybody. That's it for me uh, and the rest of us here at the show. Uh, as always, uh, we'll be back. Same batch channel. No, I just <laughs> take somebody two. else. Somebody take else two. take it. I can't Same do it. Same batch time. Same, Same batch, batch channel. channel. Thank you very much. Fan on everybody for fan and power. My name is Wes. I'm Andy. And I'm Hank. And one, two, three. Some of us will be back sometime. In the next <laughs> we'll love, love you all. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great night, everybody. Bye for now. Uh -huh.